pay for us his sacrificial death on the cross so that we might have life and we might have life everlasting. As we come tonight to the table of the Lord, we come as hungry beggars searching for God's life, and we found it because we're his children. As we partake of the remembrance of the bread and the cup tonight, we ask that uh, the, my far right or this left side, these two sections, our disciples will come down tonight and they'll stand at your row and they'll direct you to stand and come down to this table. You'll take a piece of bread and the cup and you'll take all of it here. You'll place the cup into the trash can and then you'll go back around to your seat. This middle section will come to this table here. You'll come from this side, you'll partake of the cup and the bread, place the little cup in the trash can and you'll come back around to this side. We're going to have a bit of a traffic jam here, but just be patient with one another as we work our way right around the corner. And this far left and uh, this far side over here, you will come to this table. You'll take the cup and the bread, and when you complete it, then you'll put the cup into the trash can here. As we begin our program tonight, we start with a prelude with uh, the old rugged cross and Give Me Jesus, and then we'll sing a congregational hymn. One of my favorite tunes that we I know it through the old old text is Come all Christians be committed to the Lord. But this text tonight is Jesus at your holy table that will come and sing. And so again we say welcome to this service of the of the cup and the bread and to our disciples as we share in this wonderful worship experience tonight. As as we begin with our prelude, let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, we come to you tonight with grateful hearts for the sacrifice of Christ, that you had a plan for this entire world, and even me, to come to salvation and to know Christ is our Lord and Savior. And on this special night, we come to remember the sacrifice of Jesus, his broken body, his shed blood, for the remission, for the forgiveness of all of the sins of the world, and especially for me. Help us to come in penitence, and help us to come in the exact words that David said, Lord, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Let this be our prayer as we come to the table. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Would you stand together as we sing, Jesus at thy holy table. Jesus at your holy table, may our hearts united be. Bind us with your grace and presence that redeem and set us free. Crucify our pride and hatred, light the path on which we walk. Teach us how to love each other in the way that you have taught. Christ, remind us of your passion, of your precious life outpoured, of the love which none can fathom, and our victory evermore. Bread of heaven, wine of promise, feed us with your holy word. Nourish us with your strong presence, risen Savior, only Lord. Lift your hearts and raise your voices, celebrate this wondrous love. Join the chorus with all Christians and the saints who live above. Silent lips now sing with gladness, blinded eyes are filled with sight. Jesus' love has pierced our darkness, brought us home to peace and light. Amen. Thank you. Be seated.
My name is Simon Peter. One day my partners and I were cleaning our nets after a long, hard night of fishing. We were tired and discouraged. We had nothing to show for our efforts. Jesus was preaching as usual to the, to the many people who followed him from here to there, listening to his every word. He asked if he could sit in my boat. So I rode him out a little ways so his voice would carry. When he had finished teaching, he asked me how to row out a little further and throw my nets in the water again. I told him it was pointless. We'd worked all night and caught nothing, but I did as he asked. And then, astonishingly, so many fish, the nets were broken, trying to pull them in. So many fish, we filled both of our ships until they began to sink under the weight of them. I fell down on my knees before the Lord, feeling sinful and faithless in His holy presence. Then He told me I would no longer catch fish, but men. I did not fully understand, but I left my boats, my fish, my livelihood. I left everything to follow Jesus. And I never looked back. Tonight He tells us that one of these 12 men his faithful disciples will betray him. His faithful disciples, one of us, will betray him. I vainly promised to follow him, even to death, but he looked right into my eyes and said that before the rooster crows, I'll deny him three times. Deny him? Am I not the rock he called me to be? Could I lose my Lord, my friend, because I'm not strong enough to be faithful? Jesus, is it I? I've been known as Peter's little brother, Andrew, since the day I was born. Years ago, I left the fishing business to follow that fiery preacher, John the Baptizer. He was anointed by God to prepare the way for the long-awaited Messiah. And now I follow him. I love to bring people to Jesus. I brought my brother to Jesus and have watched him grow and become a strong leader among us. I brought the little boy with a lunch of five loaves and two fish. I've even brought Gentiles to meet the master because he is open and loving to anyone searching for the truth. But Jesus has enemies, enemies that want to silence him or even see him die. And he speaks of a betrayer among us. Oh, please, do not let it be me. It will bring sorrow to my master. Jesus, is it I? I am James the Lesser, known as such to describe my stature and to differentiate me from many other men named James. Since joining up with Jesus' group of followers, I've seen the most miraculous things. Jesus has the power to calm the sea. Even the wind and the rain obey his voice. Jesus has a power over demons. He casts out evil spirits. And has allowed us to do the same in his name. Jesus has the power of healing. He has healed people that have been diseased for years. Even from birth. And now. One that sits and eats with him at this dinner table. Will betray him. Can't you see that he is the Messiah? Our Lord. After walking and talking with him. After prophecies being fulfilled. Miracle and miracle. Proof after proof. He's called each of us to follow him. Lord, is it I?
My name is James. John is my younger brother. We used to work with Peter and Andrew in the fishing industry. Jesus called us to follow him on the same day that he called Peter. And we did, thinking that he would establish his kingdom on earth and that, he would, and that we would be his right-hand men. Jesus calls John and me the sons of thunder. Well, actually, we're the sons of Zebedee, a rich and powerful man in this community who is a personal friend of some of the more influential religious leaders. At one time, I had hoped that this would assure me a position of power in the new kingdom. In fact, my mother suggested that I should sit at Jesus' right hand when he claimed his throne, and John at his left. After all, it was we who were invited to the mountain with Jesus, and we saw him transfigured. His face shone like the sun, and the voice of God spoke out of heaven. He chose me. He chose each of us. How could one of us betray him? We have seen his perfect adherence to the law. We have heard the voice of God say, this is my son. We have been present during countless miracles, healings, and works no mere man could accomplish. Could it be my brother John? Could it be me? Jesus, is it I? I am Matthew. Before I became a disciple of Jesus, I worked for the Roman government collecting taxes. I used to take advantage of one of the perks of this profession, skimming a little off the top for my own personal use, listening to Jesus. I've come to realize that I have sinned against my neighbors. I took advantage of them. I cheated them. I became wealthy, stealing their hard-earned wages and goods. My heart has changed now because of Jesus. I even threw a huge feast at my home, and I invited elders from this corrupt organization to come and to meet him and perhaps be changed as well. But now, he speaks of a traitor among us. Will the others suspect me, a known publican, a sinner? Lord, is it I? Before Jesus called me, I was a member of the Zealots. We believe in God and that God alone rules over his holy nation of Israel. We refuse to pay homage or taxes to any Roman government. It goes against my nature. But Jesus teaches that God ordained all laws and governments and allows them to rule over us. And we must give them their due and treat them with respect. Since following Christ, I have tried to channel my zeal into telling to telling others about Jesus, God's Son, and reaching out to people for his kingdom. Is there a spy among us? A Roman, perhaps? How could any follower of Jesus question his power and authority? He is God. He is our king. He is greater than any government. Could I somehow revert to my old ways? Could I, Simon, betray my king? Is it I?
I'm known as Bartholomew to some, Nathaniel to others. I've been a diligent student of the scriptures and a disciple of John the Baptizer. My friend Philip told me about this Jesus of Nazareth, saying that he was the one the prophets had written. At first, I was skeptical. Jesus of Nazareth? Filthy, immoral place. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? But John said that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Then I met Jesus, and he seemed to know me already. I know my inner, he knew my innermost thoughts, and although I've always been a devout man, I realized that Jesus was offering me something more than a, more intimate and more personal than a religion had ever offered before. For over a thousand years, we've been celebrating the feast of the Passover. Remembering the bitter slavery in Egypt with the bitter herbs and remembering the ten plagues with the ten drops of the goblet. Remembering how the blood of the sacrificed lamb caused the angel of death to pass over the Israelites and to spare their firstborn. Remembering how God set his people free. That wonderful story. How they <clears throat> fled with the time to, to cook the uh, leavened bread, so they baked the unleavened bread in the warmth of the sun. This is my body, Jesus said. And then he shared the cup and said, this is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. I don't understand. What could make me betray my friend? Lord, is it I? My name is Philip. Jesus came to me one day and simply said, follow me. I spent an entire day with him and I was convinced this is truly the promised one. It has taken me some time for me to understand that this man, this fulfilled promise is actually God here among us. Recently, thousands of men and women, families were sitting on a hillside listening to him teach. <clears throat> Jesus asked me where we could find bread to feed them all. At once, I thought only of the actual physical cost of such a venture. Why, our treasure does not hold such funds. I gave no thought to the people's discomfort or to the possibility of a divine miracle. But Jesus, ah, Jesus, he took five tiny pieces of bread, two tiny fish, prayed over them. He fed thousands and we collected 12 basketfuls of leftovers. God, here, among us. Who would deny this promised one the divine presence in our midst? To whom would this person deliver Jesus? To the vain and arrogant priest who refused to believe that God has kept his promise? Or to the pagan Roman government that fears a rival ruler? Could any one of us forget his power, his compassion, could I forget? Is it I? His hands, carpenter hands, rough, weathered hands, yet so gentle and loving. His hands reached out and touched a leper, and the disease was erased from his body. His hands reached out and touched Peter's mother-in-law, and her fever disappeared. His hands has reached down and lifted Jairus' daughter from her deathbed. His hands have opened the ears of the deaf and the eyes of the blind and mended the bones of the lame. Countless infirmities, illnesses, deformities, gone. His hands has reached out, blessing the little children that others would have turned aside. His hands has reached down, rescuing Peter from a churning sea that would have swallowed him. His hands, blessing, breaking bread, Folding in prayer, such simple gestures yet so profound. Those hands that have shown mercy and kindness, given love and healing. Those hands that have served me, Thaddeus, and his other brothers, worshipped his father. They're the hands of God in this very room. 
All of us have been blessed by his hands. All of us have seen the miracles those hands have performed. Who could turn him over to the hands of an enemy? Will I, Thaddeus, betray you? Is it I? John, the beloved disciple, beloved, loved by Jesus, loved by the one who was with God at the beginning, loved by one who is greater than all of us, yet he washes her feet, 
setting an example of humility and servitude. Now, you may think that because he calls me his beloved disciple that I have reason to be proud. Oh, how I've learned that the opposite of that is true. I once thought that he would give me a place of power and prestige in his kingdom, but he's shown me over and over that the war he wages is a spiritual battle. He reaches out to the needy, the paupers. He doesn't seek out the rich and powerful. He dines in the homes of sinners and common folk, not the elite. I have seen him equally befriend a well-known Pharisee and an immoral woman, forgiving both. God sent his son into the world because he loves the world. The lowly, me, so much, so much that he would not have any one of us to perish, but have everlasting life. This Jesus, he is the way, he is the truth, he is life. And even though we're his closest friends and his followers, I don't think we truly understand the depths of his love. I believe he would give his life for mine. How could I not do the same? Will my pride cause me to stumble? Will I betray him? Could I? Jesus, is it I? I've been listening to Jesus speak tonight around this table, and I simply do not understand. Words meant for comfort, but words met with confusion and misunderstanding. Talk of betrayal met with incredulity and suspicion. Where is he going? There's so much yet to be done right here, right now. Sometimes I marvel that I, Thomas, have seen him with my own eyes. I've touched my Lord and Master with my own hands. I've watched him perform wonders, change lives. I don't want him to go away. Not now. Not ever. And how can we follow him if we don't know where he's going? Is there something I have done or will do that will contribute to this betrayal he speaks of? Has he seen my lack of faith, my hidden doubts, my fears? Is it I? I am Judas Iscariot, the treasurer for this group. I have followed Jesus, but I'm growing reluctance of his, of his, I'm growing tired of his reluctance to take a stand against our oppressors. I believe he is who he says he is, but why would God send a Messiah for this? To wash feet and serve bread? I have no need of a spiritual king. We need a political king. Some to, someone to rise up and overthrow these Roman tyrants. Thousands of people follow him over mountainsides and across rivers just to hear him speak. Surely he could put together an army in no time. Something needs to be done to force him to make his move, to lead us to victory, to establish the new kingdom. A betrayer among us indeed. All these men sit around this table, looking suspiciously at one another, wondering, guessing, accusing. They look inwardly and ponder their own motivations. But why do they sit here like sheep, waiting for a shepherd, someone, must do something. Well, I have. Tonight, the chief priests and elders will help me help him usher in the promised kingdom. History will thank me for this. Oh, yes. Someone has betrayed him. Perhaps we all will before this night is over. Master, is it I? Whatever you are about to do, do quickly. Take, eat, 
This is my body, which was broken for you. Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. As the disciples make their way down to help direct you, let me please remind you that to partake of the Lord's Supper with us tonight, you need not be a member of First Baptist Church, Gwin. Each individual is to examine their own hearts. That's where you find out whether or not you should be partaking of this memorial meal. I'm thankful that each one of you are here tonight. Thankful that you came to be a part of such a special occasion. And as you are directed, if you would please, uh, could I have my other two servers come and follow the directions that Brother Terry gave you earlier to come by. Please join us in prayer. Father, what a privilege we have to come before your throne of grace to bring our needs, to bring our brokenness, but to bring our worship to you. Help us to remember the body of our Savior. Help us to remember his blood that was shed to cover our sins. We remember that body and remember that blood even now as an act of worship until we see him face to face. Thank you, God, for your amazing love.
praise the Lord for his presence. We praise the Lord for his eternal gift, life and salvation because of his broken body and his blood that was shed tonight. We give thanks tonight for talented people that have made this program possible. I'd love to invite our disciples to come up for you to say thank you to them for the, all of the work that they have done for this program. Would you say thank you to our disciples tonight? A special word of thanks to Ronnie Engel that has directed our disciples, and he's cracked the whip pretty tough. I know he's done a great job. Ronnie, we thank you so much for that. For our technical team that's at the back, and uh, you don't see uh, Tracy back there making a recording, we say thank you. We appreciate your leadership tonight in this. Thank you. A special word of thanks to our Guest Instrumentalist Orchestra, our people, Kathy and Barbara and Jamie, that always play for us, and especially for good friends, Mike and Gaines and Mary and Dakota and Belinda, special folks that have led us with this orchestra tonight. Say thank you to them. <laughs> to our choir and all of our singers, we have three... Wonderful guest singers. We say thank you to these three men helping us out in, in our program tonight. Blessings and blessings to you. Special persons, Mike and Kathy, that work together. Can you believe that, Mike? Help with all of these costumes up here. <laughs> Kathy single-handedly was able to sew every stitch on these costumes. Thank you, Kathy. We appreciate it. Some folks really, really behind the scenes to do our artwork. They're listed in our program tonight. Steve Gu and John Adkins, Elena Hawkins and Stan Junkin, and then also the props were Ronnie. And a special thanks tonight for, uh, to Jane Rooker and their committee and all the work they've done to prepare for our, our communion. Let's say thank you to these special people. <laughs> And now to conclude our fellowship and praise the Lord together, we're invited to a fellowship back in our multi-ministries building. And you know, us regular Baptists can eat a lot of food, so I would love for all of our guests to go first tonight, and that would really be a treat to us to serve you, and that if you're a guest in our, in our fellowship tonight, please, especially our instrumentalists and other singers, we want you to come first for the fellowship tonight. Pastor Kenny, thank you for your leadership in this time. I know that many of you have come from other churches in our community. I just want to say how good it is for God's people to come together. Amen. It's, just, it's just good for God's people to come together. We 